The new electric Aria SUV attempts to make more of an impression than the Leaf did. In December of 2010, the Nissan Leaf became the first electric car to be widely available to Americans since internal combustion engine-powered vehicles took off a century earlier. Compact, cute, and efficient, we dubbed it remarkably unremarkable, in the best possible way. Along 12 years later, and after numerous manufacturers have launched multiple entrants into the EV space the Leaf finally has an electric stablemate in the Nissan lineup. The question, is the 2023 Nissan Aria electric SUV remarkably unremarkable, or will it stand out in an increasingly crowded field? Although the Leaf was always sort of a niche vehicle for American buyers, the Aria is aimed at the heart of the American SUV market. Size like the compact Rogue, but offering mid-size Murano levels of interior space, the Aria is the first Nissan to run on the company's new CM Faran F platform. The Aria's specs likely won't raise the eyebrows of EV early adopters, but they're instead roughly analogous to the four-cylinder powered compact crossovers Nissan expects most Aria buyers will be swapping out of. The Aria launches with a 91 kWh battery pack, and a front-mounted motor, good for 238 horsepowers and 221 lbf of torque, a healthy power bump over the comparable row. The automaker also plans to offer a dual-motor, all-wheel drive version with 389 horsepowers and 442 lbf of torque, as well as an entry-level model with a smaller 66 kWh battery pack. The front drive large battery Rhea Venture Plus, which starts at 47, 1 to 5, will be the range champ of the lineup, with an EPA estimated range of 304 miles. Our mid level 2023 Rhea Empower Plus test vehicle 47, 1 to 5 to start, about $54,000 as equipped with the same battery and motor setup, is rated for 289 miles, while base, Small battery front drive models are rated for 216 miles. Dual motor models aren't rated yet, but expect about 265 miles of range with the large battery pack. While the Urea's range is respectable, its peak charge rate off just 130 kilowatts isn't particularly impressive. Rivals like the Ford Mustang Mach-E reach 150Q, while the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and Kia EV6 hit 235 kilowatts. The general rule of thumb for shoppers new to EVs. Generally speaking, the higher the peak charge rate, the less time you'll spend tethered on a road trip. Unlike the Leaf, the Aria fast charges using the common CCS1 connector instead of Nissan's preferred and increasingly rare stateside Kadimo plug. First, the acceleration and braking numbers you can skip the next two paragraphs if you'd like to go straight into the more subjective stuff. Like the Leaf. The Aria isn't a numbers car. Our front-wheel drive test SUV accelerated from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 7.5 seconds and covered the quarter mile in 15.8 seconds at 92.9 miles per hour. Although it's quicker than many of its internal combustion rivals, that's slower than all of its electric competition. Of comparably equipped single-motor electric SUVs, the Aria is closest to the Volkswagen ID4, which hits 60 miles per hour in 7.3 seconds and runs the quarter mile in 15.8 seconds at 88.8 .8 miles per hour. The F6 GT line and Mustang Maki -E California Route 1 edition are quicker still, hitting 60 miles per hour in 6.5 and 6.3 seconds, respectively, and crossing the quarter mile in 15.0 seconds at 95.0 miles per hour and 14.8 seconds at 96.8 miles per hour. If speed is your thing, and you want an Aria, you'll likely want to wait for the dual motor version. The Aria is similarly average in our braking and handling courses. It brakes from 60 to 0 mile per hour in 128 feet, be it 4, F6 and Maki -E all come in at 123, or 124 feet, and it laps the figure 8 in 27.6 seconds at an 0.61 gram average far behind the Kia and Ford, but just edging out the Volkswagen. But the Aria clearly isn't about outright performance. It's engineered in many ways to be a comfortable, compact crossover that just so happens to be electric. On that front, it succeeds. 
Acceleration isn't neck snapping, but the area pulls away with the sort of confidence inspiring authority of a Torque V6. And it has good passing power. Many EVs feature a full, one-pedal driving mode that allows the driver to accelerate and brake with just the throttle, but the area unfortunately doesn't. It's E-Step, mode ups regenerative braking, but it's incapable, by design, of actually bringing the area to a stop. More annoying than having to press the Nissan's mushy brake pedal is the fact that the pedal automatically moves in E-Step mode making it feel like the brake pedal is trying to escape your right foot when you're slowing down. The area rides and steers reasonably well. On the latter front, initial turn in is surprisingly quick. That makes the Nissan fun when negotiating traffic, but the overall feel is otherwise numb when going down the road. The ride is comfortable, but there is a fair bit of body motion over expansion joints, potholes, and curves. All-wheel drive areas can vary motor torque front and rear to control the body's pitch. The front drive version would benefit from some mitigation strategies, too. The best part about the area is the latest version of Propolot Assist. The advanced driver aid punches well above its weight. It confidently holds its line through bends, accelerates and brakes as a human would and can even change lanes automatically. The area's driving dynamics may be forgettable, but its interior isn't. The open and airy cabin is lovely to look at and be in, even if the execution isn't exactly nailed. The interior incorporates quality feeling materials, dual screens, a flat floor, and novel features such as a power-operated stash drawer built into the dash, a power sliding center console, and wood-like trim with integrated touch buttons similar to BMW's approach with the 9. The area could use a little polish, though. The wood buttons, for example, wash out in direct sunlight and don't always respond the first time you press them. Similarly, the stash drawer in the dash is incredibly useful, but you must press and hold one of the touch points on the wood panel to get the delicate feeling drawer to slowly motor out of the dash. Also, if you drive with it open a likely possibility, since there isn't a ton of storage up front the button flashes at you angrily. The power-operated center console is of limited utility, too. Not only does it sit far higher than the door-mounted armrests, but motoring it backward both takes up rear passenger space and makes it easier for your passenger's items to slide into the driver's feet. Both the console and the drawer would likely be more useful if they were manually operated. Even if some of the tech doesn't work as well as it could, the rear package is practical. The front buckets are cushy and couch-like, perfect for long stints in the saddle, while the back is adult-friendly and a fine place to spend time, even if the floor is a bit high due to the battery underneath. Despite the aggressive fastback roofline, the trunk is also spacious, with Nissan's handy divide and hide panels boosting its versatility. The only thing that could make the area more practical would be if it included a frunk like some of its rivals do. At this stage, and unless the dual motor variant changes things we fear the new area will suffer the same fate as the Leaf before it. In its current state, this remarkably unremarkable electric SUV isn't particularly competitive when it comes to its performance or most of its tech. Even so, it is a stylish and practical electric alternative, TVs like the ID4, and, perhaps more important, mainstream crossovers such as the Toyota RAV4 and Honda Car-V. Ultimately, maybe following in the Leaf's tire tracks isn't such a bad thing, after all after two generations and counting it remains among the best-selling EVs in the world. Maybe unremarkable is enough, after all.